Good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to this week's Learn with Lorna. I'm going to do my usual and just wait for a few seconds for people to join us. So welcome to this week's uh, Learn with Lorna. Thank you for, for joining me once again, or thank you for joining the first time if, if this is your first time watching. Um, if you haven't watched any of the previous episodes of this series, my name is Lorna Steele and I'm the Community Engagement Officer for the Highland Archive Service. Uh, I am based in the Inverness Centre, the Highland Archive and Registration Centre, but also work across all four of our uh, offices. And so you'll find through this that uh, I'll talk about parts from different offices, mostly about uh, Sky this week, but we'll come back to that. Um, if you would like to watch uh, any of the earlier ones, if you haven't or you'd like to rewatch them, they're all available on our Facebook page and all available on the High Life Island YouTube channel. Um, so please do go back and, and watch them and uh, let us know what you think. Uh, thank you for everyone saying hello. Um, who have we got? Australia, Orkney, Olapool, uh, Sri Lanka. Amazing. Um, Glenfinnan, so a big mixture of people. So it's really, really nice to have you all with us and thank you for uh, saying hello. It's always nice to see them coming in. The other thing I wanted to say before I go any further was to thank you for the comments from last week. Uh, last week, I looked for the second time uh, at the asylum records that we hold and it's an extraordinary subject, very important, very uh, emotive, and I was very glad to see uh, that, that you'd appreciated it and enjoyed that subject. So if you didn't get to see that uh, live, then please do go back and have a look. Um, before I go any further, just to say, wow, there's all sorts of places coming in, uh, China and Germany and all sorts of places. So it's lovely to have you with us. Um, before I go any further, just to say uh, that this is brought to you by High Life Highland at no charge to the viewer, at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland, uh, and so there is no payment or subscription required to take part in this event. So at no point should you be subscribing to anything or entering any payment details at all. There, there's no charge to take part in this event. So this week we are looking at uh, Crofters, Cotters and the Napier Commission. A couple of things I want to preface this with. One is that this is a huge, huge subject and I will be giving a very um, small glimpse into this subject using some uh, examples from across our collections and also to say that I am in no way an expert on this subject. So I'm going to give you a, a basic overview of it um, and I will point you where to go uh, for, for more information. And I think potentially we'll look at doing a second follow up to this because there are so many individual stories that we can uh, talk about. Good, we've got West London and Cyprus and Somerset and Aberdeenshire and Sky, all sorts of places. OK, so you'll be familiar, I'm sure, with the word uh, croft and the word crofters, something that is kind of very typically associated with uh, with Scotland. There's uh, an image possibly in your head of a small house or a, a small farm, maybe a small holding um, with a, a little bit of land. That's probably the typical image that people have, mostly associated with the Western Highlands and the islands, although they are uh, spread across. The crofting system really came in from the 1700s and 1800s, kind of overtook from the Runrig farming system. And I wanted to start with a couple of definitions um, so I'm going to read some things to make sure I get my wording correct. So the definition that came about in 1886 was that uh, a croft was a small area of agricultural land held on a tenancy in one of the seven crofting counties. And the seven crofting counties were um, Argyll, Caithness, Inverness, Orkney, Ross and Cromarty, Sutherland and Shetland. There have been many subsequent definitions of what a croft is, and I think um, if there are any solicitors watching, they'll know sometimes it's uh, a little bit of a difficult thing to pin down. So a crofter, therefore, was someone who lived on a croft or lives on a croft. Uh, and a cotter was some, the, the terminology tends to, to be used to describe a farm labourer or a tenant who's occupying a cottage in return for labour. So that's definitions of crofter and cotter. And of course, many, many, many crofters still 
uh, in the Highlands and in, in other parts of, of the country. The Dictionary of the Scots Language, which if any of you have not come across the DSL, I would highly, highly recommend it. It is such a useful resource. Um, it's available online and that gives the definition for the cotter of a tenant on a farm who occupied a cottage with or without a piece of land attached, the farmer working the cotter's land in return for services rendered. And then they go on to say that it's also applied to a married dependent on a farm who has cottage, a cottage as part of his contract. So that's the sort of um, loose definition of crofters and cotters. So obviously the traditional uh, image of, of crofters is that they are working a small piece of land usually, um, possibly ro uh, rearing a small number uh, of animals and grazing their animals usually on common land, common grazing land. Um, yes, Fiona, DSL is brilliant and free. So yes, do have a look at the Dictionary of the Scots Language. Um, so what happened? Uh, where did the Napier Commission come from? What, what happened to change the way uh, crofters were existing? So there's a few things and we need to talk about the, um, the context of what was happening here. So we're looking at the 1840s onwards ish. And again, this is all, um, there's a long time period involved here. So we've come out with the clearances. If you're not familiar with that, then we did a learn with Lorna a while ago looking at the clearances. So if you want to go back and watch that one, that will give you a little bit more background contextual information. This often involved people, um, oh, people watching in crofts. That's nice. Hello. Um, so yeah, this the, the clearances, one strand of the clearances often involved people being moved from one part of uh, an, an area to another, often moved to land that wasn't as good. Um, and often because of a change in land use. So there would be um, large swathes of land taken over for sheep farming and then later for deer uh, farming or for deer shooting. Um, and people would be moved off the land that they had traditionally occupied and moved to another place. Sometimes people came in and bought up estates. So they would come into an area, buy an estate and move the people off it. And that was something that um, I'll touch on later when I'm talking about Sky in particular. So these created new townships, produ produced overcrowding in certain areas and created so big areas of land that were used for one thing and then a lot of people crammed into other land. There were increased rents because of this, so the landowners would realise that if they increased people's rents, they could make more money from sheep farming or from deer. And so if they increased the, the rents to try and get that equal, but of course, there, in many cases, not a lot of chance that the crofters would be able to, to pay the increased rents. So that's the a kind of background. Then we have the collapse of the kelp industry, which is where a lot of the people who had been cleared were moved to the coasts to work in the kelp industry. Then that collapsed. And then we went through a series of very harsh winters uh, with crop failure. So we're coming nearer and nearer now to the 1880s, which is really the, the key time for what I'm talking about today. In Caithness, there was um, not only the crop failure, but a, a collapse of the fishing industry for a couple of seasons because of in harsh weather and particularly bad storms, which destroyed equipment and destroyed the farm, the fishing industry. Um, and if you were watching when I did the Wick Harbour records, then you'll be familiar with the, the problems that were faced in Caithness sometimes. So that all comes together to create um, a kind of tension boiling pot of things that are going wrong. People are not able to afford to pay the increased rents. There are um, famines in some areas. The crop failure leads to food riots. Um, and so the result of this is that you have some people living on very poor land, a lot of people living in small areas, um, raised rents, which they're not able to pay because of crop failure, and people being moved and moved from place to place. And they had no security in, uh, against being evicted a lot of the time. And that was one of the biggest uh, problems. And an example of all of this can be seen in our Sky and Loch Alsh collections. Now, I, and I'll touch on this several times throughout, th this happened, was widespread across the Highlands, but I'll particularly really be talking um, about Caithness and about uh, Sky because these are the um, areas that we have a lot of collections relating to the subject. So in 1855, Lord Macdonald, who was um, one of the 
uh, landlords in Skye. He sold the Kilmure estate on Skye to Captain William Fraser. Fraser tried to increase his income, as, as many uh, landlords did, by raising the rents uh, and by rearranging the tenants. So he tried to move people from place to place onto the poorer land to make way for sheep grazing. And we hold a lot of documents about this in our collections. And if you have family who are connected to the area, please do get in touch with Sky and Loch Alsh Archive Centre because these records are amazing for helping you trace the people who lived in, in Skye. So in 1864, documents that we have in our collections show that um, rent rolls and things show that between 1863 and 1866, people were moved from, this just this one example is from one side of Glenconnen to another side. So they're cleared away from the south facing side where they were able to farm and moved on to the north facing side, which was hit by cold winds and wasn't as good uh, land for farming. And we can see the proof of this in the records that we hold. You know, you can see people all listed in the rent roll for one place and then they disappear from that rent roll and they reappear in another place. And so I wanted to read to you um, a quote from that. And this record says is dated Uig 7th of January 1864. And it says, as we find Mr. McDonald, um, as we find from Mr. McDonald your factor that you wish that the position, the, the portion of North Glenuig Common applicable to the farm of Penconig should be cut off from the said common and added to the said farm, we the tenants hereby agree that the said portion shall be cut off accordingly. And we hereby agree to abide by the, the march, so the, the new boundary, which you shall uh, fit and draw out. And we hereby further agree that we shall not ask or claim for any deduction of rent on account of the portion of common grazing being cut off. We are your most obedient servants. So we've got it in writing that they've said, OK, we agree to the fact that you're reducing the land, that you're not going to give us access to it. And we agree that we will never ask for a reduction in rent because of that. So. The question, of course, is how willingly was that statement made? Um, and we'll come back to that. They've written out an agreement. Your instinct says, is that um, was that a willing agreement that you've said we don't mind losing land and we don't mind um, paying the same for the land that we don't have anymore? So what did they do in result to all of this kind of culmination of, of problems and grievances? So they started to rise up against uh, the against their treatment. They started to complain about their treatment. There were protests, there were land raids. Um, there was a lot of rent. There were a lot of rent strikes. So people refusing to pay their rent. They started to demand for fair treatment and fair valuation of the property that they were on so that the rents couldn't just be racked up. Um, they needed to prove that they, um, they, they were looking to prove that the land value was what they were paying. And one of the main things that they were trying to demand was security of tenure. So they wanted to be sure that people couldn't just arbitrarily evict them and, and put them off their land. It sometimes turned violent. So there are some areas in which this turned into a, um, a violent protest. I'm seeing some people saying they had no choice. They had to agree or they had to go. And yes, in some cases, that's absolutely true. And I'll come on and touch on that in a second. And um, so this escalated over several years. As you can imagine, this is a very risky situation to be in because the people you're protesting against are the people who can go, go. You know, the, your landlord, to some extent, has has a huge amount of control over you. And if you then uh, rise up against them, the danger is that you get told to go. So this happened across the Highlands. There were slightly different issues uh, in different places, depending on where you were. But this culminated really in what became known as the Crofters Agitation or the Crofters War. And this was from about 1882, 1888 uh, time period. And there are a huge number of instances of things that happened across the Highlands, but I'm going to focus on three particularly. And I'm very conscious of my time because, as I said, it's such a big subject. I will try not to run over too much. Um, so I'm going to focus on one from uh, Caithness, from the parish of Latheron, and two from Skye, which some of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with the Battle of the Braes and uh, Glendale. So in 1882 in Caithness, the Crofters formed a, a body to agitate to re for reform. They wanted the large farms to be broken up. So in, in Caithness, there'd be many large arable farms created 
and people moved often to the coasts for work. And what they were petitioning for and, and campaigning for was to have um, large farms broken up. They wanted the, re the rent to be reduced and they wanted to get a reformer in as Caithness MPs. So they wanted an MP for Caithness who would be willing to stand up for land reform. In Clyth Estate, which uh, is in Lathrum Parish, that was the one that was hit most badly by rent racking. So the tenants demanded a commission from the government to inquire into the situation. Um, and they also petitioned their landlord directly, Adam Sharp. So their rent, in 1882, their rent was due in Martinmas, which is, uh, is November time. And they sent a delegation to approach Sharp, the landlord, to ask for the, lent, the land to be revalued more fairly. And in the end, 200 of them went to Bruin Lodge where he was staying. And they pointed out the fact that the rents were ruinous and the fact that there had been fishing failures and storms and crop failure and that they were desperate and that they couldn't afford to pay this. But the landlord refused to listen to them. And so the tenants agreed to go on a rent strike. And the result of this was that it made the national news and was brought before um, the House of Commons. What I find interesting about this story um, is that some of them wanted to entirely uh, strike on their rent, they didn't want to pay their rent at all, but others felt that because the ultimate aim of what they were trying to do was change the law and transform the law, they felt that they couldn't do that if they were on the wrong side of the law. And so it became a moral dilemma. And so in the end, they decided to pay what they could and continue to, to petition and to write and, and, and argue for change. And I'm seeing, Christopher Stewart, I'm seeing you uh, correct me to say Highlands and Islands. Of course, you're absolutely correct. Generally, I'm only dealing with the Highlands in my job, but yes, this subject absolutely covers the Highlands and Islands. So that's 1882 in Caithness, and we leave them at that moment petitioning government, petitioning the landowners. At the same time in Skye, the Battle of the Braes takes place. The Braes is an area of Skye just um, near Portree. They, the tenants uh, on this area had had their traditional grazing land taken away. This was on Ben Lee. And so they had similarly had had a rent strike and said, we're not going to pay our rent if we can't graze our animals on the, the land that we've always been able to use. And so we have circulars in our collections sent by the factor uh, of the estate saying, I'm going to read this, saying that your rent is overdue, not paying your rent is illegal, um, that you have no rights to claim on the grazing land, and that your rent is lower than other people's in Sky, so you shouldn't be complaining really. And as people were saying uh, a little bit earlier, exactly that. If you don't pay your rent, we're going to evict you. That's it. And they didn't pay. So sheriff officers were sent to uh, evict the leaders in April 1882 but the crofters burned the eviction notices and protested against the people who were coming to, to get rid of them. And so 50 policemen were sent from Glasgow to Skye to support um, the authorities, if you will. Um, but the crofters, men, women and children, met those police officers with sticks and stones um, and drove them back. Now, some of them were arrested and they were taken to Inverness for trial. They were convicted and fined but there were many journalists present at the time of the Battle of the Braes trials in Inverness. And what that did was it brought widespread publicity and brought a lot of sympathy to the Crofters' cause. Um, and some of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with Mary Vore, who was um, a, a lady from Skye who wrote poems and songs and music about the, the treatment of the Gales, the treatment of the Crofters. Uh, and the inequalities that they faced. And Battle of the Breeze was one of the instances that she took a lot of uh, inspiration from. So we leave Caithness petitioning Parliament and we leave the, the Breeze crofters in court. And we come to look at the third story, which is in Glendale, which is in the northwest of Skye. And again, there had been protests over a, a, a period of time and they had the misfortune to come into contact with Sheriff Ivory, who is famously notoriously uh, tyrannical and he had already had some run-ins there was already some bad blood there with the um, the, the crofters and, and the residents of glendale and so he had suggested that government troops were sent in to restore order to glendale and the government said no but said that they would support uh, an increase in policing for the Invernessshire police force and so there were an additional 50 police 
put into the Invernessia police force. But the riots continued, and again, a, a common theme, they were also protesting and demanding the land of uh, the return of common grazing land. And so the Glen Glendale crofters made a stand and they grazed their cattle on the land despite being told not to. And the same actually had happened in Caithness and Dunnet, um, where the cattle were at the starvation point, and so they cut the fence and let the cattle out um, onto the land to, to graze. So in Glendale, there were court orders sent in January 1883, um, ordering them to stop grazing their cattle. This didn't work. Um, a police report that we hold in our collections talks, uh, describes a horn blowing in all directions and people running through the streets. I saw the tenants running past, each of them armed with a new stick made for the purpose. So uh, a lot of um, refusal to, to, uh, to stop what they were doing. And so Malcolm McNeil of Collinsay, who was one, a civil servant, he went um, was sent by gunboat, um, HMS Jackal, with some Marines, and he was sent in to negotiate with the Glendale crofters. And what happened was that five crofters agreed to stand trial, uh, effectively on behalf of the community. They said, we will go and stand trial, including their leader, John McPherson, who became known as the Glendale Martyr. And they served, these, these crofters served two months in jail in Edinburgh. So we have Caithness petitioning the parliament. We have um, the Bray's crofters, in court gaining public sympathy uh, and we have the Glendale crofters in jail gaining martyrdom and as I say that is just very small instances there were famines in Lewis there were a huge number of other uh, events happening across the Highlands and Islands but what this culminated in was that a Royal Commission was announced now I'll come on and just say a little bit about the Royal Commission which was not um, a, a massive success, um, but I'll come and talk about that in a second. But I think we should not underestimate how important it was that the commission even happened, because the fact that the crofters had in, been able enough their, their case heard to, to get people to listen to them and have a, a royal commission was something uh, very substantial. So before I come on and talk about the commission and, and what came of that, just to remind you, as people who watch uh, often will be familiar with, to remind you that this event is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and that there's no payment or subscription required to take part in these events. If you're able to donate towards our work, then we would very much appreciate that. And there's a link on our Facebook page to do that. So in March uh, 1883, the Home Secretary agreed to set up a Royal Commission and the, the remit of the commission, and I'm just going to read this to make sure I get it exactly right. The remit of the commission was to inquire into the condition of the crofters in the highlands and islands of Scotland and all matters affecting the same and pertaining thereto. So this was chaired. And again, I'm just going to look at my notes because I don't want to miss anybody's name out. Um, it was chaired by Lord Napier of Ettrick. So he was a border landowner. The, the group consisted of Sir Kenneth Mackenzie, the sixth baronet of Gerloch, Lord Napier, obviously a border landowner. Donald Cameron of Loch Eel, who was a landowner and also uh, MP for Invernessshire. Charles Fraser Mackintosh, who was uh, the MP for Inverness Borough and held some land out with the borough. Sheriff Alexander Nicholson from Skye. Professor Donald McKinnon, who was um, uh, in the first, uh, he was involved in uh, the Celtic studies at uh, Edinburgh University. And Malcolm McNeil who we talked about a second ago, who was from Collinsay, his father was a landowner, and he was the one who had tried to negotiate with Glendale. So you're maybe seeing a bit of a theme there in the people who are involved in this commission, which is that there is only a single one who is not in, in a landowner or connected to land ownership. So of course, immediately when the commission was announced, people were delighted that the commission had been announced, but were immediately saying, but this isn't a fair representation. The people who are, who are investigating this is not a fair cross section. So they toured the Highlands and Islands, gathering evidence. And if any of you were watching on Health and Wellbeing Week, um, when I talked about that, it's very similar to the set out of the Dewar Report, um, the Dewar Commission, which was to look at health inequalities across the Highlands and Islands. Very similar setup. If you haven't watched that one, please do. It's absolutely extraordinary. Um, and so it's a very similar setup. 
the committee toured uh, around the Highlands and Islands, gathering evidence. And they spoke to a range of, of people. They went to a range of places to find out what the crofters uh, and cotters' grievances were. And what is amazing about this, about the evidence that was gathered, is that, is that we think it's probably the first detailed, written body of work that gives an insight into the lives of ordinary people in the Highlands and Islands. So it's an absolutely invaluable collection um, of, of information. And if you're interested in reading this, then um, please do go and have a look at University of the Highlands and Islands. They have the whole digitised evidence, all five volumes um, available on their website. Um, the Highland Land League, who were active at the time, also went around helping the crofters gather um, collect what they were going to say to the Commission. Of course, that meant that some people accused them of... Um, <laughs> I'll come back to that comment in two seconds. Um, that meant that some people accused the Highland Land League of coaching um, uh, the crofters. I'm laughing because someone's just saying that the auto captions are a hoot. Um, I'm sure I'm always very wary about captions. So if I say anything that seems rude or inappropriate, it's the captions, not me. Um, and so if you remember, I talked a little bit about Glen Conan and those people who moved from one side of the hill to the other side of the hill. Um, and I said, do you think that agreement was signed willingly? We get an insight a little bit more into that through the evidence to the Napier Commission. So Malcolm Nicholson, who was one of those moved in that area in Sky says, our original crofts were turned into a sheep farm beside us. There were 42 crofters of us all in the place. We were all removed, some to Australia, some to America and to various other parts. When we were in our first crofts, we were comfortable. We feel now quite the reverse. It was Major Fraser who removed us. And the commission said, you went to your present place against your own will then and not with your own consent. And he says, very, very much against our own will. And many of us were weeping at leaving our former places. Others confirmed this. Evidence uh, was given that, that shows that grazing land was taken away, that dozens of families were moved from place to place, that rents were being raised um, exorbitantly in, in a way that they just couldn't afford to pay. And in Caithness, to go back and, and carry on with that story, the Commission... Uh, arrived in Caithness on the 4th of October 1883 and I'm just seeing uh, Fiona saying yes they got a huge amount of information in a very short time and that's absolutely true I mean it was it was such a short time that they that they toured and five volumes of, of information and so they came to Caithness on the 4th of October 1883 so about this time of year mainly they came to hear from the Clyth tenants who I spoke about at the beginning the ones who had, had petitioned Parliament but people from the whole area came, people from across the whole county, including Adam Sharp, the landlord, who had refused to listen to his tenants. And when he gave his evidence, he was jeered and booed, and the place was packed to capacity. People didn't want to hear what Adam Sharp had to say. And in fact, Lord Napier said, I need to end this day's hearing because I can't continue with amongst such, amongst such a riotous assemblage. I'm going to quickly reference that I'm seeing um, maybe some of you will also be seeing Fiona speaking um, commenting on on this talk and I know that uh, a little while ago she had written a little bit about one of her relatives who had given evidence to the commission so I'm just going to touch on that quickly as well he was a tenant uh, Donald MacDonald on the Cromarty Estates uh, in Strathpeffer and he gave evidence to say that they had also been constantly moved from one place to the other um, they had been told to sign leases when they'd signed them. They'd be told that they'd been given a, they would be given a copy of it, but they never got their copy of the information. Um, and he also spoke again about rent increases, reduction in grazing, and the fact that he um, that, that that they tried to stand up but but weren't really heard. So as I say, right across the Highlands and Islands. So in Sky, uh, Dougald McLachlan, who is a great favourite of. Catherine, our trainee archivist in Sky, um, he was the Sheriff Clark deputy. He was the Gaelic interpreter for the commission because, of course, you can imagine so many of the people uh, who were interviewed spoke Gaelic and so they needed a Gaelic interpreter. And so this was Dougald uh, McLachlan's job. 
Between 1882 and 1886, he was investigated by Sheriff Ivory, who we have talked about before, um, because Sheriff Ivory felt that he had been far too supportive of the crofters and wasn't impartial enough. And so he was investigated because in 1882, um, Dougal MacLachlan had been the one who had mediated between the crofters at Braes and the landowners. But the police, and it's quite, I don't know if you're all familiar with the word cliping, um, telling tales on. There's a letter in our uh, in our collections that is basically a police uh, officer in Skye writing to the police in Inverness and telling tales on Dougald, um, uh, on Dougald MacLachlan and saying that he, basically he's hobnobbing with the crofters. So can he be trusted as impartial? He's meeting them in hotels. Um, he's been, been ch seen chatting to crofters late at night. And in the final day of the evidence in Portree in uh, May 1883, Dougal MacLachlan stated that the majority of the crofters here are living hand to mouth. And he suggested that the funds of the established church, so the Church of Scotland, um, should be used as grants. And that if, it, if the money from the church was given to the crofters, then he said maybe there was a chance that these crofters would be able to work their way up to owning their own holdings. And he also says something particularly powerful. He says, although people are overcrowded and there's lots of people living in, in Sky and in, in these areas, he says there's plenty of land in Sky to have large farms. There is no need for this overcrowding. So he's saying the problem is not that we need to get rid of people and ship them overseas because there's not enough space. He says there's plenty of space. The space is just not shared out. So as I said, there's a total of five volumes of evidence. And the result of this, of course, was that a report was published by the Napier Commission, and that was issued in April 1884, and it was 111 pages long. The recommendations that the report made were not unanimous. There's some suggestion that some of them were made entirely by Napier on his own. Um, and there are several kind of addendums at the end with various members of the committee saying, I don't agree with that part of the recommendations. So they couldn't get a unanimous uh, agreement between them. And the overall feeling at the time was that the recommendations made by the Napier report didn't actually suit anybody. They didn't suit either side. So I'm going to read to you a, an extract from the Times newspaper that was published on the 29th of April, 1884. And it's a very long article and I'm only going to read you um, a little bit of it because they say we're not here to give an opinion on this. We're just going to tell you um, the facts, the findings of the report because they say we're quite sure um, there will be a lot, there will be much more discussion and comment to come. So it says, by, uh, by some, the, repos the proposals of the commissioners, which constitute, it must be admitted, a very significant invasion of the laissez-faire, will be considered a mischievous and unwarrantable interference with the rights of property and the natural operation of economic laws, while others will probably regard them as, as disappointing inadequate and half-hearted. So there's an admission straight away that this this report is, is not going to please anybody. The landowners are going to feel like it's they're, too much is being given away and the crofters are going to feel like they're not being given what they've asked for. Something which I find quite extraordinary that the report concluded that the average amount of moral and material welfare is as great now as a, at any previous period, and the poorest classes were never so well protected against the extremities of human suffering. But they did make some recommendations. They said uh, that tenants whose uh, holdings had a rental value of £6 per year and who were not in any rent arrears should be given security of tenure uh, in 30 year improving leases. So they should um, be able to be secure that their land, they wouldn't be evicted, their land wouldn't be taken away from them and that there would be 30 year leases which were um, came with improvements to, to the land and the holding. They also wanted to kind of group these together in townships. The problem was that the vast majority of the crofters were not paying six pounds a year and so really that that change in, in suggestion didn't really have an impact on them and um, something i find quite extraordinary really that the report said um for those people who fall under the six pound per year bracket 
We hope that the humanity of landlords and public opinion will prevent any evictions or rent racking happening. They actively said that it would be impossible for them to grant security of tenure to everybody, uh, to all of the crofters and cotters. They said that was quite uh, quite impossible. Um, and so, as I say, it's really the outcomes of the commission didn't didn't really please anybody. But as I said, it's it's so important that it happened at all, um, and that the commission even took place. So, as a result of the report, there was a temporary quelling of protests. There was a, a kind of temporary. <laughs> Um, calm, but really it was, wasn't for long at all. And there were many more fights and protests to come right across the Highlands and Islands. Um, it was a hugely important landmark of something to happen, but no legislation came directly out of the Napier uh, Commission. But it did lead in some ways to the Crofters Holding Act of 1886. And that really was a turning point for those who owned, uh, for those who lived on crofts in the Highlands and Islands. Again, the Crofters Holding Act was, was not perfect by any means, but what it did do um, was give security of tenure, and that was a huge, huge turning point. It also established the Crofters Commission, um, which of course still exists. It's gone through various um, formations and changes, but it is of course still in existence. And of course, what the Napier Commission really did was light on the issue at all and bring public attention what was happening uh, to the crofters and with the landlords. If you're interested in finding out more about the subject, um, as I say, this is a very brief overview and, I, and I'm certainly not an expert in it. Um, we have a huge amount of material in our Sky and Loch Alsh Archive Centre, including rent rolls and police records and all sorts of things. So if you're interested in finding out more, by all means, contact any of our um, archive centres, particularly Sky and Loch Alsh has a lot of material. And as I say, if you want to read the evidence, that's available on the UHI website, University of the Highlands and Islands website. Thank you for watching. I hope that that has given um, a, a slight <laughs> look at this, um, something that was such a, a, a big turning point in, in the history of the Highlands and Islands. Um, thank you for watching and joining me. I, I really hope you've enjoyed it. Um, a reminder that this event is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and that there's no payment or subscription required to take part in any of these Learn with Lorna. I hope you can join me next week. I'm going to be looking at um, the history of Inverness Castle and the Spirit of the Highlands project. Um, and I'm going to, today or tomorrow, be uh, uploading the next set of uh, of events that are coming up, um, probably looking to run them through uh, till Christmas and the next batch that I'm putting up. So um, I hope you can join me next week and join me for subsequent episodes as well. And if you want to go back and watch any of the earlier ones, please do. They're on um, Facebook and on YouTube. Thank you.